Amen. Awesome. Love that student blessing. I really do. Hey, so glad you're joining with us online today. I think God has something really powerful for us, and I am really looking forward to opening up the Word with you. So if you have your Bibles or electronic devices, turn with me to 1 Samuel 19. 1 Samuel 19, that's about eight books in at the very beginning of your Bible. And so we're going to take a look at, uh, at David's life, and he's going to be our guide through our series. As you know, if you're just, if you're actually, if you're just joining us, we're in a series called Transition, so you may not know. And you can catch up because we're only one message in, and I would love for you to make sure you tune into those places so that you can hear kind of the foundation of where we started. And I'll give you a quick recap in just a moment. But as you're turning there to 1 Samuel 19, let me share with you with a story. Let me share with you a story that is amazing to me that seems like it was just yesterday I was sitting in this person's office, but I, I went back and I, I realized it was about 16 years ago. And this story started when I was sitting in front of my friend, my pastor, my counselor, because how many of you know every pastor needs a pastor, and every pastor needs a counselor, let me just tell you right up front. And so I was sitting in front of my friend, and he began to share with me as I was, I was in a moment, a deep moment of transition in my life. There was so much going on, and I was in the in-between, and I, I just needed some language to help me navigate this crazy space I was in. And that's really one of my hopes for this series, is that to give you some language of what this means when we're there. So I'm sitting in his office, and he's sharing, and I'm sharing, and, you know, we're getting to that space, and he just looked at me, and he goes, hey, have you ever read a book called Tales of the Kingdom? And I said, no, I've never read this book, and basically, it's a, this really beautiful children's story, this three-book series, and I, I had never read it by the mains, and it's really, a, again, a powerful book series. So he goes, I'd like to read to you a little story. So I'm like, oh, you know, I'm in pastoral counseling. You're going to read to me a story. And I'm like, okay. And so he opens up the book, and it was called Princess Amanda and the Dragon. And I, I've shared this many years ago on how pivotal this was to me. And, and again, this is about 16 years ago. And so think about this, how much it ingrained into my mind. And I, I think it will really speak to you. So I'm sitting there, and he's beginning to share the story of Princess Amanda and the dragon. Now, the story is, of course, an analogy of the kingdom of God, and all the stories kind of relate to different parts of the kingdom. And Princess Amanda is like us, a, a co-heir with Christ. She's a daughter of the king, and she's living in this beautiful forest, and she enjoys the being in community. She enjoys being with all the other princes and princesses. And, and the person that takes care of them is called the caretaker, and the caretaker basically is kind of a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And there they are enjoying it, and every year they get an opportunity to go where the dragons lay their eggs. And the children love it because the eggs are so beautiful on the outside, and they all are jeweled and all of these things, and they, they have a moment, just for a moment, to hold the eggs. But the caretaker always says, but you can never keep the eggs. So Amanda, being Amanda, decided that, well, I, they're so pretty. And so she grabs one of the eggs, and she ends up taking it home with her. And innocently, she puts it on her shelf, and then until one day, that egg begins to rattle, that egg begins to crack. And out from this egg comes a small, little, beautiful, smooth dragon. She loves the dragon. She holds the dragon. The dragon puffs warm air on her cheek, and the dragon eventually becomes her friend and her pet. She says this, I have perfect aim. He has perfect catch. We must be the perfect match. And she would sing and play in the sun with this dragon. And then as the dragon began to get older and Amanda began to get older, the dragon began, of course, to get bigger. And as she would play with the dragon, the dragon began to get a little bit more rough. But still, they loved to be together. And every time that Princess Amanda would have to leave to go and be with the other royal children to celebrate the king, the dragon would cry deeply, and eventually Amanda would begin to feel so bad and horrible that she would stay longer with the dragon. And at nighttime, when she was supposed to be worshiping with the king, she would stay behind with the dragon because the dragon would just begin to wail. Eventually, Amanda actually began to get a little bit angry about the laws that said they couldn't keep dragons. Why can't I keep a dragon? Why can't I share my dragon with others? What's the harm of one small dragon? And after one small trip to go get large amounts of food, because how many of you know when a dragon gets bigger, it needs to eat more food? And she came home to her home, and she saw that all of her walls were, were scorched, and that her hollow that she lived in was now becoming more blackened, and it smelled like charcoal. 
The dragon, who was usually always so glad to see her, was now looking at her so differently, not so much pet as more prey. She was so very careful, Princess Amanda, never to stand in front of the dragon's nose or mouth because every once in a while fire would come out. Of course she felt in her heart the fire was never to harm her. It was always an accident. Until eventually the caretaker showed up because he began to smell smoke in his forest. And he came to Princess Amanda and says, you know, what's wrong, Princess Amanda? I, I don't hear you sing anymore. I don't see you gather with the other children to worship the king. And it seems I'm seeing fires all over the place, and it just smells like smoke. And it's been such a very long time since I've seen you, but I, something's not right, Amanda. And as the days went on, Amanda began to protect the dragon, hide the dragon, lie about the dragon, until the dragon was what, much too big to live in her home, and she had to hide the dragon now in the forest. And then one day when she went to play with the dragon and fly with the dragon one more time, the dragon looked at her like he had never looked at her before. No longer was there a care in the dragon's eyes. It was the idea that, Amanda, you are mine and now I'm going to kill you. At that moment, all Princess Amanda knew was the words of the caretaker that he had whispered to her many, many months ago, looking at her almost knowingly, saying, Amanda, if you ever need my help, please don't hesitate to call. She calls out, and in a moment, the caretaker is there. And I'm leaning, you guys, I'm in this session, and I'm, now I'm leaning over my chair as my friend Gary is reading this story, and I'm like, what happens to Amanda? And then he just does this, he goes, okay, I'll see you next week. I was, what? I lost my mind. And I drove home from Elsinore all the way, like, I can't believe he just left me halfway in the story. Now, these are the days before you could just kind of Google the story or, you know, go to your Kindle. I, I was like, I got to get the story. I can't wait a week. I ordered the book, but the book didn't come. And now I'm hanging in this longer in-between space wondering about Princess Amanda and the dragon. Man, I'll tell you, when you're in transitions, it feels that way, that space Sometimes there are dragons in our transition, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what that means and how to navigate that. Let me just quickly remind you of a few things I shared last week. I quoted William Bridge. He said this, every transition begins with an ending. We have to let go of the old thing before we can pick up the new, not just outwardly, but inwardly. And I shared at that, 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 but that moment that we are all experiencing these kind of transitions, but we don't recognize that everything that is happening in this moment is not just shaping the outward of what we see, but there's something that God wants to shape deeply in the inward. Something that the extravagant love of God wants us to now pause and reflect and say, what's going on inside? Transitions give us that kind of space in our spirituality. Jeff Goyne says this in his book, Life is Waiting, Not Just Waiting in Line at the Grocery Store, Waiting to Renew Your Driver's License. But his, his, this line that just captures my heart is this, Our lives are full of inconvenient setbacks, not due to some great cosmic mistake, but because of some divine purpose we don't comprehend in the waiting we become. And as I shared last week, that's one of the goals. That, that's the first principle we want to land in when it comes to transitions. This foundational uh, principle that's so key to this whole moment is that you would know that you are loved by Jesus and that you would know in this moment our goal is to become like him. That that's principle one. And if you, if you don't get that principle, beloved, something will not be settled for you during the whole series. I, I promise you, that has to be the foundation of transition, that I am loved by Jesus and that he is helping me to become like him. All right, if you're at your Bibles or you're at 1 Samuel, say amen, and let's put our hand on our Bible, one hand on our heart, and repeat after me. Father God, open my heart to receive your word today, and Holy Spirit, open my mind to receive your truth today. And now Jesus, bless my neighbor to live out your commands today. Amen. Let's make Jesus famous. 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 18, one verse, here we go. 
Now David fled and escaped. He came to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. He and Samuel went and settled at Naoth. Let's just pause there for a moment. So here are these two words that we're going to see repeated over the next several weeks because as we look at these little moments in David's life, this idea of fleeing and escaping becomes a pattern for him. Can I just tell you, that is a normal pattern in transitions, that there is a sense of fleeing and escaping. This word fled is a Hebrew word, bara, and basically it means to run away, to flee. But the root meaning, or I shouldn't say the root meaning, an additional meaning to this word it came from kind of a description of a metal bar that was used as a kind of a door lock. So something that was impassable, something that put a barrier in front of you. So the word kind of combined into this idea that not only does it mentally say something about being barred, it also physically says uh, something about getting away. And then you combine it with the word escape and it really literally means to flee to safety, to save oneself, to get out of the danger. So when you combine these two concepts of fleeing and escaping, it's running away to safety, yes, from what may be chasing from behind you or a danger that's in your present, but it also is something that seems like a barrier or impassable. Have you ever realized that sometimes when you're running away or fleeing and escaping, it's not just because you felt the danger of a situation, you know, like Freddy Krueger chasing you down an alley. That's a real fear, police people, right? But there's the reality of that there's something that's going on inside you, a barrier of, 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 that's constricting you to who you're supposed to really fully become. Transitions. Give us an opportunity to look at this area of our life more closely and recognize that there's sometimes these things that we're fleeing and escaping are going to land with us wherever we go because what we're fleeing and escaping is actually inside of us. Let me give you a little background on David's journey here so that you understand what he's fleeing and escaping from. If you've ever watched any mafia movie, any mafia TV show, here's where they stole the plot. David is revealed at the beginning as the shepherd boy king, right? He's the one that uh, God loves and loves his heart. And at the same time, there's this other guy named Saul, and he's the freshly appointed king, demanded by the people, appointed by the people. God, give us a king, and the people choose a king. Saul ends up not being the right king. So David is anointed as a young boy by a man named Samuel, the very same Samuel he's visiting that I just read about. The prophet speaks on, the, on behalf of God. That's Samuel's job. He, he knows who's supposed to be anointed as the next king. And so only Samuel and David and the prophet who speaks and his family and God know that David is about to be the new king because if Saul find, finds out, that's going to be a problem. So David goes on his merry way. And then one day he's asked to bring lunch to his brothers at the battlefield. You know the story. It's probably his most famous story and episode. He gets to the battlefield, the line is drawn, the Philistines are on one side and the Israelites are on the other. They're afraid. David comes to the line and says, what's going on, bros? What's happening here? Well, this giant over here named Goliath, we're not ready for him. Well, where's Saul? Where's, this is the Fraser International Version. You're not going to find your scripture. Where's Saul? What's he doing? He's our leader, isn't he? He's the king. He's supposed to be the one as our champion to fight Goliath. They're like, we don't know where Saul's at, bro. So he's like, all right, I'll do it. He grabs some stones, he swings, one stone, boom, hits Goliath in the head, kills Goliath. Nothing new for David. David has killed bears and lions. This is what he does. He kills and he says, listen, don't insult my God. Don't do it. And from that moment on, Saul's like, wow, I love this guy. He's good with a guitar and a sword. I want to keep him around. So Saul then spends time with with David, and David, of course, is there in worship, and he's helping out Saul many, many times, and uh, Saul sends him on missions, and David is that guy. He's the guy who succeeds at everything. You know that guy. And Saul is happy. And so one time they're coming back, and they're entering into this parade, and he hears over the radio this song that has become really popular. And the women are beginning to sing this song. And it says this in chapter 18. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. 
Next verse, verse 8, Saul was very angry, for this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and they have ascribed thousands to me. What more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul's eyes, David, from that day on. I love that picture. You eyeballing me? Because that's the reality. This is what now becomes happening between the life between Saul and David. The next time they're together, they're in a worship experience. Saul freaks out, throws a harpoon at David in the middle of worship service. Not just once, but twice. Now that's a church I would love to go to. That would be awesome. Isn't Pastor Aaron so happy he's not there right now? Saul cools down. And David goes on and does more missions and does, what does David do? He does what David does. He's successful. And then he comes back and there's a little bit of family draw, drama. Who, who's, who's he going to marry? Which daughter is he going to marry? And Saul has it in his mind that he, he's not just saying, oh, David, I love you. Here's my daughter. You can marry any, anyone you want. He, he's setting him up for failure. He's saying, I, I'm going to do this so I can kind of trap you. And then he sends him out to the Philistines again because he's not saying, hey, let's build the kingdom together. He's saying, I'm hoping the Philistines will slay this guy, this tens of thousands of guy. And he sends David out again. But David is what? He is successful. Why? Because the anointing and favor of God is on him. Saul wants to kill him. Now back to another worship service. And I just got to ask, where are the ushers? Don't they know not to bring a harpoon or spear into the sanctuary? That's going to be number one protocol when we return. Trust me. Saul goes after him again. David flees and escapes, we read. And throughout this story, we will see this pattern. But one more text just to give you the background of why David's running Chapter 18 again, but when Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that Saul's daughter, Michal, loved him, Saul was, I want you to get this, it's really important, was still more afraid. Say that with me. Saul was still more afraid of David. And then one more line added. So Saul was David's enemy from that time forward. Wow. Wow. So a new word is added to this fear and jealousy enemy. Now we know why David flees and escapes. This is going to be so important for us to learn and to lean into as another principle of transition. Because it's, it's not just from danger on the outside, but underneath there's a challenge of who David is and who he's going to become or not become. And fear, you know, it does strange things to us, doesn't it? It brings all kinds of things. Fear and anxiety, it does all kinds of things. It can make us run sometimes for no reason, or it can make others run from us for many reasons. But I want us to consider, what do you do with fear and anxiety in this moment of transition? Because here's the reality. Fear and anxiety will be a part of every transition. I love what one physician said this way, all of us have reservoirs of full potential, vast areas of great satisfaction, but the roads that lead to those reservoirs are guarded by the dragon of fear. And I would suggest that in transitions, the fear of the unknown that is ahead of you or the struggle of what you've left behind or what you're facing right in front of you is so absolutely real and common, the key is what are you going to do with that dragon that is guarding the potential of, becoming, uh, of you becoming more like Jesus and more acquainted with how much he loves you. One of my hopes during this whole series, one of my, my goals is just to give you language over this experience of transition, beloved, because this will not be your last one. So that when fear and anxiety show up, please hear this, this is so important. When fear and anxiety show up, we don't start believing that we are without faith or that we are so, no longer in God's graces or that God is trying to punish us. I, I want you to really hear this, that in this moment of transitions in your life, you have to understand that fear and anxiety are real, but it doesn't mean that you're not still a person of great faith. 
that you're not still under God's graces. So many times this dragon comes to steal first your identity, not just to where you're supposed to be or where you're going or what you're experiencing in the present, to steal who you are, to steal who Princess Amanda really was. N.T. Wright, one of my favorite pastor and theologians, said this when asked the question, what would you say is the most frequent command in the Bible? Wright responds, what instruction, what order is given again and again and again by God, by angels, by Jesus, by prophets and apostles? What do you think it is? Is it be good, be holy? Or on the negative, don't sin, don't be immoral? No, he says, the most frequent command in the Bible is don't be afraid, fear not. In transitions, I want us to start looking at fear and anxiety and say, dragon, I know you're there, but your fire must now become a wisp of smoke in my life. See, this next image, you see that there's two ideas of a dragon. You can be on the left side where all the dragon is just blowing all of its fire on you all the time. Or you can see the dragon like Mushu, who's just going to stick your tongue out to you, but has no power over you. Because your dragon, hear this, this is so powerful. Your dragon is actually more afraid of you. Remember what I've said. David is, yes, afraid of Saul. So he flees because his life is in danger. That makes sense. But who is Saul afraid of? Saul is actually afraid of David. So follow me here. Fear drives David out but it is fear that is actually afraid of him. That our dragons are actually afraid of who we are and what we can become. Why? Because fear, whatever fear is, personify whatever your Saul is, sees your potential like God does. And we will see that over and over in David's story in transition. Everywhere he goes, everywhere he finds himself, people are like, aren't you the anointed king? Aren't you the slayer of thousands? Aren't you the killer of Goliath? He, he, they, they see in him, even though fear shackles him sometimes, because there's such a potential. And instead of the Saul's in our life raising up and saying, I want to build into you, the jealousy of that moment begins to shut the doors like a barrier. You see, fear is actually afraid of you because of who you can become in Christ. Wow. You see, Saul didn't learn in his transition of leadership of becoming the king his full potential. Instead, he learned, he, he learned that all he had was his ability and his good looks. And let me tell you, beloved, his gifts and his good looks got him in the door, but his character did not allow him to sustain his rule. And could it be that maybe you're like, Pastor, I, this fear thing, I'm not, that's not me. Can I just tell you, fear is at the root of a lot of things, and one of them is control. I read this, when life spins wildly, we grab for a component of life we can manage, our diet, the tidiness of our house, our careers, our ego, our spiritual life, our church, in many cases, people. However, the, most insecure, however, the more insecure we feel about being in control and loss of control, listen to this, the meaner we become to others and ourselves. We growl and bare our fangs. It sounds like a dragon to me. Why? Because we feel cornered and out of control. It was once said that Hitler was an evil man because he was a terribly frightened man. Fear releases the tyrant in all of us. And I want to just add, beloved, and fear wants to add a blockade, a barrier to your destiny. Sometimes we are thrust into a transition like David fleeing and escaping for his life. And sometimes transitions are thrust upon us like our current circumstances. Nevertheless, knowing what happens in transitions will help you process them more fearlessly and faithfully. And how will you process this fear of the unknown? How will you slay your dragon? How will you get through this barrier? This is what David does. Go back to verse 18. Now David fled and escaped, and he came to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. He and Samuel went and settled at Naoth. The first thing is this, beloved. you got to remember your promise. 
David remembers the promise. He remembers Samuel. Samuel is technically retired at this time. He's just kicking it back at Ramah. He's not worried about what's happening with the drama. His heart is broken over the fact that Saul was anointed king, but his heart is hopeful that David will someday be king. So what does David do when he needs to flee and escape? He flees back to the promises over his life. He flees back to the places where he knows he is confirmed and affirmed that I am called to be the anointed next king. And beloved, you need to be reminded in these moments when fear and anxiety enter into your transition. Wait a minute, dragon. I'm a co-heir with Christ. Wait a minute, dragon. I am part of the royal priesthood, a holy nation. Wait a minute, a dragon I am in Jesus and the fullness of God dwells within me you see David had to learn some things in this moment otherwise he would have become another Saul and you will see that that's going to be part of David's journey all the way through because he's gifted he's good looking he can play guitar he, you know he, ha he has it all going on all of it he's that guy all of his gifts. He has everything that Saul had and more. But David is picked because of his heart, not because of his gifts. And if David doesn't get into this transition to find out what's going on in his heart, he will always find himself in trouble. And if you know the story of David, he finds himself in trouble. So when you are in these places and fear and anxiety come, you got to make sure that you're leaning into the promise. Otherwise, the dragon will try to shape your identity and become that which you hate. So don't forget your heart in this moment. Don't forget the promises over your heart. And you're saying, Pastor, I don't know what those promises are. Then, beloved, it leads to the next point. Remember your posture. David must remember the power of worship. See, Ramah is a location, a geographical location, but everything in the Hebrew language has meaning behind it. It describes things. It gives you great description, both in, in the physical and, I believe, in the spiritual. Ramah is, is a place that literally means high, above, hill, exalted, raised up, to draw away from. And so there's this idea that when David goes to see Samuel, who's the spokesperson of God, the, the reminder of the promises of God, he's got to get back to a place of posture of worship he's got to get to a higher place and if you were with us you you know that that's so important with we set our mind on higher things to to be renewed in Christ is to set our mind where Christ is and worship allows us to get to that space so when you are like I don't know what my promises are worship is the venue and avenue for you to recognize what the promises are this this story is so amazing to me he's in Rama this high place, a place of worship, because Samuel is the anointed man of God. He's the, the person who hears God. God, are you speaking? This is me. Send me, God, kind of guy. The guy who's willing to confront even evil kings. I mean, this is a bad, holy brother. And I love that. And so he gets into this place with him. And the people that are coming after him, this is so crazy. Saul finds out that David's at Ramah. And Saul sends a group of men and says, go kill that guy. Go kill him. I find it interesting that whenever we're in a place of worship, the enemy wants to attack us. We think that the enemy attacks us outside of worship. No, 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 beloved. The enemy attacks you when you're in worship. That's why he's so afraid of us. Whew. Ooh, let me just let that settle in for a minute. So there, the men come. They show up where Samuel and David are. And immediately, as you read on in this chapter, the Spirit of God hits them. The, the Scripture describes it as they get into what's called a prophetic frenzy. They become floppers and flippers for Jesus. They don't even know what has hit their body. The Spirit and the holiness and the kabod of God has hit them so heavy, hello, that they got to just start flopping on the ground. They don't know what's happening, and they begin to prophesy. What? What? So they come back and report and say, I don't know what, to ha what happened. We went to kill this guy, but then Jesus showed up. And then he sends another group. Same thing happens. Another group. Same thing happens. Saul's like, all right, I'm tired of you guys. You don't know what's happening. Saul gets there. He worships so extravagantly, he loses his clothes somehow. Now that's a different kind of church service. And we don't do that here. But the reality is this. It's so powerful. And now think about this. When you're in a posture of worship in the midst of your transition, when fear and anxiety is trying to steal your identity, and you're in a posture of worship, that which is coming against you has to bow its knee. 
That's why wherever Jesus went, oh man, wherever Jesus went and the demonic came to him, who was Jesus, a person who was in the posture of worship all the time, and the demonic came and was like, we know who you are, and they had to fall down or they had to travel into pigs into the sea because they didn't know what to do. Their bodies began to shake. And I'm telling you, believers, if you are in the kingdom of God and you would get into a place in this transition and fear and anxiety comes at you to say, you need to stop, dragon, and bow your knee because the Lord is in this place. Could it be that we are getting attacked in our minds and our spirits because we're not a people of worship? If you're only singing the songs that we play with you online and you count that as your worship, that's not worship. That's some worship. If the only time you're in the Word of God when you see something on this screen and not even in your own hands, that's not enough. And you wonder, man, where's God on Monday through Saturday? Because, beloved, when you're in transition, you got to double up. You got to get the exponential worship on. You got to be in the Word more because the dragon's going to mess with your mind, he's going to mess with your mouth. Man, I got to tell you, beloved, the people of God. Oh, man. I can't move around too much because cameraman go crazy on me. Okay, think about this. I don't, I'm not even sure I should go here. We are so challenged right now about the church gathering. And I feel that challenge. And I, I, it wrecks me coming into this room and not seeing all of the beloved here. But I will tell you this. Why can't we still be as powerful in our worship wherever we are? If we're just reserving our worship to just this moment, could it be in this moment God is teaching us to be a people that know how to worship 24-7? That we're not vicariously living our worship out through our gifted worship leaders who are amazing and anointed and I'm so grateful. But if I'm letting them do all the work, by the time I get to heaven, I'm gonna be really out of shape. And I'm telling you, beloved, in this moment, and I'm not criticizing, I don't have time to fight that battle right now. I gotta be in a place where I'm slaying dragons with you and on your behalf. And I know that the only way I can slay the dragons of this moment and culture and situation is through the worship of the king of kings who is not anxious in this moment. And he doesn't look like a dragon to me. So could it be that we need to be a people that remember the posture of worship again? That biblical worship is the full response of head, heart, and hands to who God is and what he has done and how we can love our neighbor. That in this moment, even for the people of God, they are always in, when they're in transition, they have to be reminded, don't forget to worship me. They leave Egypt. Where's the first place they go? I mean, in my mind, it's like, let's cross through the water. Get me into the promised land, God. This is good stuff for me. The first place they got to go is to a mountain where the presence of God is. And then they get there and they're like, I don't want to go. Moses, you go. That's exactly where God is telling us again. It can't just be for the special people. It's got to be all of us. And could the breakthrough come when the people of God rise up and say, wait a minute, I'm a disciple of Jesus. I'm not going to wait for someone else to sing a song. I'm going to sing. I'm not going to wait for someone else to preach the gospel. I'm going to preach it. I'm not going to wait for someone to set up a small group. I'm going to set up a small group. Come on, church. We're in this in-between. And God's trying to teach us his presence, not for the special people but for all of us. Otherwise, could it be like the people of God? We'll just be in another 40 years in a wilderness transition, thinking that we're in community, loving each other, living off manna, which is fantastic, but missing the fruitfulness of the promised land. Let's move out of this exile, beloved, but let's move out of it with the glory of God. Hmm. Okay, point number three, I gotta stop. So here he is, he, he, he remembers the promises, he remembers his posture of worship. Let me, let me go back to that. Find your style, find your song, play it every day. Do it, just do it. 
Find the passage of Scripture, read it every day. Find a way to serve someone and do it every day. Let it be your act of worship. I, I promise you, every day, and you're going to start seeing breakthrough in your transition. And you're going to see your dragons start to fall. Third, David learns this. you got to remember your position, man. Where are you? He goes to Nayat. And it means, literally it means habitation, dwelling place, a place of rest, a place where you abide. It means home. And to me, my mind immediately goes to John 15 where Jesus says, hey, abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Over and over, Jesus reminds us, abide, 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 remain. This Greek word meno, I, it, it's so parallel to this moment in David's life that I need to learn how to tarry where you, guard, God, are. I need to endure where you are. I mean, this word that's used 120 times in your New Testament, mostly by Jesus, it means remain, stay in me. And when we're in this moment and the dragons of fear and anxiety are coming, you got to ask, where are you making your home and what are you letting in it? It starts as an egg, but it will crack. And it will start taking over your heart and your home. So you have to decide, I'm going to dwell where Jesus is. And so for David, he goes to a place where the spirit and the presence of God is. We're all abiding, but we have to decide where. I think the answer to that question will help us understand where God is, where we are, and how to draw near to him. When you remember your promise and your posture and now your position, something begins to happen and the dragon has to move back because there's no more room for the dragon of fear to live there. One of my favorite quotes comes from Henry Cloud, Dr. Henry Cloud. He says this, we change our behavior when the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of changing. That's so big that consequences give us the pain that motivates us to change. Now, it, it's almost like a little bit of a mind twister, but you got to hang in there and just let it settle. We change our behavior when the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of changing. That in these moments when we wrestle through this, this, this stuff, we got to decide, is this where I want to live? Do I want to live in this place where I'm not fully becoming who I'm supposed to be in you, God? Where the dragon of fear and anxiety are, are guarding the places of my full potential? You know, next week I will share that David doesn't stay here. And I'm like, oh, David, David, David. Why not stay where every time your enemy comes, they have to dance before the Lord? I mean, that's where I want to stay in this world, in this life, when I know that anything that comes against me, the presence of God is so strong that that which is coming against me must dance and bow its knee. But David doesn't stay there. And that too, beloved, is part of transition. There are some things that we'll learn next week about what it means when we leave places like that and we learn some other things. But for the meantime, this principle, you gotta hold on to because David will continue to return to it, you'll see. So here are a couple questions for us to think about this week. What is the dragon of fear in your transition? Name it, define it, and reduce it. Say that again. Name it, define it, and reduce it. To the mushu it is. The second question is this. Who are you in Christ? In this transition, you should be asking that question. Who am I in Christ? And see, this is where I... Oh, Jesus. Um, as the people of God, we, we're, get, we're a little confused right now. We're a little confused because we're, we're looking at who other people are in Christ. And what other people are doing where we should just be really, really focused in on who am I in Christ? Who am I in Christ? Who am I? Number three, what does your act of worship look like right now? In your heart, in your hands, and in your head. All three of them, all week. What does it look like? What dragon are you worshiping? Gotta ask that question. So what's your act of worship? 
Lord, I got I got to lean more into you and your word and, and the song of the day. And Lord, that you'll move me in a place of service right now. And then four, where are you abiding? Where are you remaining? Where are you hanging out? Hmm. So I'm sure you're thinking, well, what happened to Amanda? <laughs> So I sat in his office the next week, and I'm like, tell me about Amanda. He's like, what, Amanda? I don't even remember talking about it. Like, you're funny. Tell me about Amanda. So we went through a little bit of our session, and I'm like, I'm not even listening to what he's saying. I'm like, you must tell me about Amanda and the dragon. He pulls out his book, and he begins to read the story. And he says this, from the caretaker. If you ever need me, Amanda, just call. And caretaker gazed at Amanda for several long minutes and turned around again and continued on his way. Eventually, you know, Amanda's in a place where the, the dragon is there and it's about to just devour her with fire. She cries out to the caretaker, 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 I'm too small for this terrible dragon. Help me. Instantly, caretaker shows up standing beside her. He must have come bounding at the moment. And Amanda screams, kill it, kill it, screams Amanda. The great beast begins to lurch towards her, raises itself on the hind legs, ready to roar out its fire. And the caretaker says this, no, Amanda, I cannot kill this dragon. And this line dropped me. Only the one who loves a forbidden thing can do the slaying. You will always hate me if I do it. Only you can slay this dragon. Wow. He lifted his eyes to the sky and he says, in the name of the king, Amanda, for the restoration, you must slay the dragon. He throws to Amanda his battle axe. And in this moment, she draws all of her courage, all the strength of her little arm, and throws it at the dragon's heart to slay it. The last line of this chapter reads this. So the princess discovered that when one loves a forbidden thing, one loses what one loves the most. This truth is a hard-won battle for each who finds it, and it is always gained by loss. In transitions, when the dragon of fear and anxiety comes, the question will be in front of you, who will slay the dragon? We will all cry out, Holy Spirit, slay the dragon. And the Holy Spirit will say, I am in you, slay your dragon. You have to slay the forbidden thing, beloved that place that's causing you fear and anxiety, keeping you from your destiny, barring you from worship, from promise, from presence. In this transition, that is gonna be one of the deepest lessons that you will have to learn is how to slay this dragon. But once you do, you will be free to become more like him like never before. In the next few moments, we're going to sing as a time just to reflect and respond. And I, I, I want you to think about a couple things. If you're new with us and you're new to this idea of Jesus, like this is your moment. This is your moment during the song to say, man, I, I need Jesus. I need the help of a Savior. I need the Lord to enter into this moment of my transition so that I'd even have the tools to combat these things that are dragons against me. It's as simple as this, beloved. He wants to first make sure you understand that he slays the dragon of sin and death, that you no longer have to lift it up. That's one dragon that you, you don't have to fight for. He already proved it at the cross. He, he, he did it already. It's one, all you have to do is accept. And then once he does that, he's gonna give you tools to begin to slay the other ones. But it takes the first step of saying yes to his love. So I hope that you do that. And then for us who've been around the church a long time, maybe been in our faith for a long time, maybe it's time for us to really recognize that we have to put some language to where we are in this transition of who we are in Christ, what we've been abiding with, and what needs to be slain. So as the worship team begins to sing this song, I pray that you take a few moments 
and you would recognize that our king is there and that you are more than you could ever imagine as a son and daughter of the king. So for the kingdom, let's slay our dragons. All right, let's worship for a few moments and reflect on that. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? 
We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. And as we left our own light to shine, we unconsciously give others permission to do the same. I hope that today you recognize that you are more than you could ever imagine and that your life has been called to manifest the glory of God. Your first step is to say yes to his love. And I hope that you'll give me the privilege of praying with you today for you to make a decision to follow Jesus all the days of your life. And in a moment, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pray that prayer, and you're going to repeat after me. But let me again encourage those who are watching who have already said yes, let this be the week that you slay your dragon. Let us be a people in the, minute, the, the, the moment of transition. Find ourselves, recognizing that fear and anxiety are there, but I'm still a person of faith and grace. And in this moment, I can arise to something more than I've ever imagined. Let's move into that, beloved. All righty, friends. If you're here and you're wanting to make that decision, repeat this with me. Jesus, you're the Son of God. You gave me life over sin and death. And so today, I'm choosing to accept you. And I'm choosing that I will no longer live in fear and anxiety that I will choose you in the midst of these real feelings and recognize you are with me, that you will never leave me, that you have forgiven me, and that you love me. So today, I accept you as my Savior and as my Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you as you've made that decision. Pastor Janelle is gonna give us some instruction on what to do next with that. We're so grateful to welcome you into the family of God. And for the rest of us, ECF, I love you. I miss you. I look forward to seeing you again soon this upcoming week. God bless you. Amen. Pastor Fraser shared earlier that when you are in a posture of worship, anything that comes against you must bow. So over these last few moments, I hope that you chose to worship. And if you made a decision today to surrender your heart to Jesus, that is a form of worship, which means that any lies or fears that would want to creep in and rob you of that joy must bow to the name that is above every other name, Jesus. If you called on that incredible name today and invited Jesus to be Lord of your life, please let us know. You can say something in the chat section. You can email us, call us, visit our website. Let us know so that we can celebrate with you. But for now, extend your hands and let me pray this over you. As it says in John 15, God chose you, beloved, to be connected to him. As you go into this week, may you be reminded of the incredible truth that you don't need to be the vine and you don't fight dragons alone. God is the vine, our God who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Stay connected to that vine, my friends, through promise, through posture, and through position. Let his goodness pass in front of you and be a slayer of dragons. You are seen and you are loved. In Jesus' name, amen. Breaking
Jesus. 